Okay, everybody. Hi again. It's uh, Charles Lane again in Farrow. We, we, we're going to start. So um, there's myself, Chris Malumphy, and Mel Manley in York, uh, and we have colleagues down at Forest Research who are managing the webinar. Um, so first of all, welcome. So it's the first webinar we've done, so you'll need to bear with us. I'm just going to ask, uh, my background is in plant pathology, uh, dealing with diseases, and then I'll hand you over to my two colleagues here just to introduce themselves, if that's all right. I'm Chris Malumphy and I work in a team of entomologists at FERA. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the oriental chestnut gall wasp today. Thank you, Chris. Mel? Hi, I'm Mel. Um, I work on the support side of observatory, just trying to bring everything together and get it up and running. Thank you. Uh, and our colleagues down in Alice Holt, would they like to say hello? Hello. <laughs> Uh, this is Anna, Anna Perez here. I am one of the pathologists at EFA, and I will be talking to you about Calara today. <laughs> and I'm Lucy, and I work in Anna's team, part of the Tree Health um, Diagnostic and Advisory Service. So I do sort of the admin on that side of things. Great, thanks. So we're going to start off as Chris is going to talk to us about the Oriental Chestnut Gall Wasp. Um, at the end of that presentation, if there are any questions that will pop up, um, that we can deal with now. We'll be happy to do that, but if not, we'll, we'll pop answers back on the forum. Uh, and then we've had a couple of really nice questions about ash dieback, and again, between Anna and myself, we're going to deal with those questions. So I'll just hand over to Chris now, if that's okay. Okay. Well, as, as you're all familiar, Observatory was set up to monitor tree health in the UK and to provide an early warning system for new threats. And it's very timely, because just over a week ago, was the first UK finding of the Oriental Chestnut Gall Wasp. It's confirmed at Ferrer. It's been found in a wood uh, in Kent, and so we really need the help of the observatory volunteers to go out, preferably as soon as possible, to look at sweet chestnuts to see if you can see any signs of galls. So the, the actual pest we're looking for is Dryocosmos curifilus, commonly known as the oriental chestnut gall wasp. This particular insect is actually native to China. And it's, um, it was introduced to Japan in, in the 1940s. It wasn't actually scientifically described or named that. It, it was actually described in the 1950s. It spread in Asia. It was introduced into North America, the USA, in the 1970s. And in Italy, it was found in 2002. And since it was first found in Italy, it's become very widespread and very damaging and harmful in Italy. This is because it's, Italy is the fourth largest producer of um, sweet chestnuts. It's also spread in continental Europe and around the, um, in southern Europe. And it has a restricted distribution in Croatia, France, Germany, Hungary, Portugal, Slovenia, and Spain. And although we could see this pest on the horizon sort of, sort of heading our way, um, it was a bit of a surprise when some um, amateur um, gall recorders found some infested chestnuts in a wood in Kent in June. And this is hot off the press because the, the identification was only confirmed um, on the 11th of June, so it's less, it's less than two weeks ago. So I'm going to talk about the biology of the pest now. It, it forms galls and it's host specific. It only feeds on Castagna species and the species that's most at risk in the UK is sweet chestnut, that's Castagna sativa. It has one generation a year and this species is parthenogenetic this means that there are only females. There have been no adult males ever recorded. So the females will lay eggs and those will develop into further females. And this is uh, important because even if you only have a single female introduced into a new area, that's enough to start um, an outbreak and a new population. The eggs are laid um, in buds at the end, well, in July, and August. What I should say is that the life cycle has been studied in great detail in southern Europe, particularly in Italy, where it's a major pest. The life cycle 
in the UK, we we're still learning what is actually how it behaves. But we expect the eggs to be laid in the buds in July and August. Uh, they will hatch, but the larvae don't develop. They just sit in the buds throughout the whole of the autumn and the winter, and they don't develop until bud burst in the following spring. And as the larvae develop, they induce a, a gall. Um, they will then pupate in June and July, and the adults will emerge at the end of June to August. The, the adults are tiny. They're only about two and a half to three millimeters long. They're black, and they have orange legs. But the probability is you're never going to see the adults. They're really, um, they're sort of highly cryptic. Each adult female can lay about 100 eggs. So you, you, can, um, you can work it out yourselves. You only need a small number to, if they can lay 100 eggs each and let those survive, then one year you could have 100 eggs. Um, the following year you could have 10,000 um, ad adult sort of females. The populations can explode. Um, the eggs are laid in small groups. They may be, may be laid singularly or in groups of three to five on individual buds. So looking at the, the actual the sort of life cycle on the next sort of slide, um, I have a gall which is cut open and you can see a, a single chamber uh, that contains um, a larva, but you could have several chambers inside the galls. And this is related to the size of the galls. The big galls have lots of chambers and larvae inside. The small galls might only have a single larva. Um, and then you can see a, a picture of the larva pupa and the adult, as, as I've just described. On the uh, next slide, I can show you the symptoms that we would like you to look for. These are the, the galls, which are actually highly distinctive. And you're, if you find a gall on sweet chestnut, um, the probability is it is going to be the pest that we'll, we want you to look out for, the uh, oriental chestnut or wasp. The galls are really highly distinctive. They, they're, they're almost sort of spherical, and they can develop on the, the petioles, the leaves, and the um, stems. They're initially green in color. They expand rapidly, rapidly and um, as they mature, they can develop um, a very um, quite attractive pink rosy sort of color. They can be up to four centimeters, so they can be really, really quite conspicuous. So the, the next slide also shows you some um, further sort of symptoms. And you'll find the, uh, the galls on the, the apical growth, the new growth. Um, it can cause um, quite a bit of leaf distortion, and it will kill off the, the apical buds. But as I'd, as I'd mentioned before, they're really um, quite conspicuous if they're present, and they're not likely to be confused with anything else that's currently found in, in the UK. So if I move on to the next slide, I appreciate these slides um, are loading um, very slowly, so I, I'm thankful for your patience. Uh, in Kent, the the, um, the wasp was found in some sweet chestnut wood that's been coppiced. And some of the coppiced trees we found very large numbers of galls on. At the moment, um, the, the wood is being surveyed by the Forestry Commission. And they've started from this sort of epicenter and they've moved out surveying five kilometers and now 10 kilometers. And the initial survey um, should be completed uh, by today. And once an assessment has been completed, then they'll decide on what action is, is appropriate to um, contain or, um, or, or eradicate the pest. Uh, next slide, please. So why are we concerned about this pest? Um, the oriental chestnut, um, sweet chestnut gall wasp, is the world's most important pest of castagna. It can reduce nut production by 50 to 70 percent um, because it can gall and destroy the, the, the flower buds. It causes, it can actually disfigure the trees. Um, it causes, when it kills off the apical buds, you get um, epicormic growth. So you get a lot of lateral shoots growing from the base of the tree. So for ornamental trees, it, they don't look as attractive. 
the impact to coppice, we, we have an important coppice industry in the southeast of England, particularly Kent, is unclear, but it does kill the apical buds and at, at very high levels uh, it has been known to actually kill um, small trees as well. So the next slide please. So what do you do if you find a gall? I, I collect insects, so I know how exciting it can be to find something new. But what I would urge um, people is not, please do not take a sample. And please don't take it home. Don't take it to show uh, your friends. Um, take a photograph rather than a sample. And if you do find uh, what you suspect is a, is a, is a gall, um, please report it via tree alert on forestry.gov.uk. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. That was excellent. Do we have any questions from anybody who's uh, dialed in they'd like to ask Chris? Um, yes, if I may. Pam Malt up in Cheshire. Um, Hi, Pam. I suspect it's going to be a while before it gets up here, but um, I'm slightly confused. You were talking about the galls being in the buds, but the photo that's on the screen at the moment, the last slide and a couple previously, seem to be showing galls actually in leaves, or am I misunderstanding something? No, that, 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 that's a very um, interesting question. The, the information that's been published based on the experience in, in southern Europe and Italy, the, the galls have developed primarily um, in the buds. The eggs are laid in the buds and the larvae develop in the buds. But in the, um, the UK, a lot of the galls have formed within the developing leaves. So the buds have already opened. So oh, the, okay. um, the, the actual development of the gall in the UK, because we're further north and things may be developing slightly later than, um, say, in Italy, means that the, uh, we were seeing something probably a little different. So that the, the, lots of the galls that we've found um, are in, actually in the foliage and distort the foliage. But you will find the galls forming in the buds, which is the, the common situation you find in Italy, and then you end up with, the, you end up with like the, the, the twigs with what looks like a huge berry on the actual tip, and that's the actual bud that's just been, the whole bud's been formed into a, um, a gall. So in the UK, what's actually happened is the leaves have started expanding before the gall has started forming, so you get the galls forming right in the middle of the um, leaf. In, in some of the photos, the, the, these are sort of um, hot off the press, and some of these photos are of the early galls. Later on, as I've mentioned, I think on the last uh, picture, um, we showed some more mature galls, and they're a lovely rosy pinkish yeah. color, and they're, they're really quite distinct. But if you find um, a gall, and it could be a centimeter right up to four centimeters, which is really quite large, if you find a gall like that on some leaves, then um, or on the, on, the, on the buds or the stems, then yes, it, 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 please report it. The, the, the thing about um, Cheshire, or the thing about the, the distribution of sweet chestnuts within the UK, the vast majority of um, sweet chestnuts are down in the southeast of England, and they do uh, coppice, this is a crop, and they do have um, sweet chestnut woods. So it's not something that's, that's likely to be encountered in, in the north of England but we're still very keen, wherever you're based, to, to please go out, if possible, uh, this weekend. We'd be really grateful to look at sweet chestnuts in your area. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, is that helpful, Pam? Yep, thank you. Great. Does anybody else have any more questions on the uh, gall wasp? Um, yes, yeah, this is Adam in uh, Welling Garden City. Hi, um, Adam. I'm assuming that if the galls uh, appeared this year, it means the wasps were here last year. Yes. And, and if that's the case, um, or also how far do they travel, do those wasps travel in, in a year? I mean, is it they just go to the next tree or is it, do they travel kilometres? The, um, the dispersal potential of the adults is relatively low because they're very poor flyers, but they can be carried in wind currents. So uh, the Forestry Commission are measuring the wind currents uh, where they found the um, infested woodland at the moment. In, in Italy, they've, um, they've looked at the progression of the wasp and they have found it moving between five and eight kilometers a year. 
but this is in an area in Italy where they have huge infestations, where they have millions of these wasps. So a small percentage may be blown uh, several kilometers away. So the, it, it seems to it spread relatively quickly um, in Italy. I mean, in theory, these wasps, which are parthenogenetic, which means they don't need to mate, a single female could be caught in an air current and blown you know, many kilometers. They could, there's also a possibility of them hitchhiking, so they could, be, could move further than this five to eight kilometers. The, the, the population in, uh, that we found in the wood in Kent is still very localized. We're still um, completing the survey to make an assessment of what the appropriate action is. Um, it hasn't been found outside the woodland, although, there, as I've mentioned, they've already looked in a, um, a, a up to 10 kilometers away, which is a huge effort and a huge area that the um, that Forestry Commission have put into um, determining the extent of this pest. It's still sort of very localized, um, so we're, we're waiting for it until we've got all the results before a decision on what action is taken. But in terms of um, the spread in, in the UK, of course, the first thing we need to do is find out if it's outside this, this wood. Um, and if it, if, it, if it establishes, hopefully it won't. But if it does, as I said, the, the, the sort of um, distance it's been traveling in Italy is approximately five to eight kilometers a year. That's okay, probably great. more information Thanks. than you needed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. I, I think we must move on, actually, if that's all right. That's been really interesting. If you have any more questions, any more thoughts, feel free to pop it on the forum and we'll come back with some answers in due course. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Anna in uh, Forest Research down at Alice Holt, who's going to give us a little bit more information about the diagnosis and recognition of ash dye back in mature ash trees. Okay, thank you, Charles. Uh, yes, uh, on... The best way to recognize uh, probably Calara on, on all the trees, um, obviously we'll see a dieback, dieback in some of the branches. Uh, you can see some in the, uh, the dieback in the pictures on the slide. Um, also, this uh, epicormic growth is quite typical. Then when you see the tree from the distance, you can see this kind of um, grow kind of the leaves in bunches. Uh, you know, it, it has this kind of ball effect. Um, but um, if you have a closer look to the trees, um, you will see probably on the trees the lesions on the either on the uh, trunks uh, or stems or on the branches. Um, but I would say if you would like to see if uh, a woodland um, is affected by um, calara. Uh, one of the best uh, ways to, to detect it is on the fallen, on the rapices of the fallen leaves of the previous year, and I think that is quite successful when you when you are trying to determine if the trees are affected. Um, and the best time for to look for these uh, fruiting bodies of um, of Calara, uh, it will be uh, really this is the right time of, of the year. In theory, is from June till October. But we know uh, from last year that we started to see the fruit bodies on the rapaces and also at the base of the smaller trees. Um, we did see them from the beginning of May. Then depending on the weather conditions, the fruit bodies may appear before June and they may last till the end of the season. Um, another uh, close-up symptom could be on the leaves you may see some spots on the leaves, um, and these can be quite kind of a scatter spots on the foliage. Um, these are mainly uh, lesions that they are caused by the ascospores when they are released from the fruiting bodies, that they are on the rattises. Um, and normally is the initial way of infection in, in the trees. I don't know if that is... Uh, more or less, I think I went through all the different phases. I don't know if that's uh, good enough. You would like to ask something else? Uh, I, what I would just add as well, because I, I, I share the volunteers' problems with trying to identify ash dieback mm -hmm. on, on mature trees. Yes. So I spoke to one of the tree health officers uh, from the Forestry Commission, and he said often if you suspect symptoms in a mature tree, 
it's actually a very good idea to look down at ground level at some of the regeneration growth around the trees. And you might actually see some symptoms on some plants which are smaller and you can actually physically examine. So, so I've started using that as a strategy and I think it's working really well to date. Yes, uh, you are right there. Um, I mean, in fact, uh, I was uh, last week in one of the woodland and yes, if you have regeneration, uh, that's a, a really good way to do it. And you can find, uh, obviously, in the regeneration, you may see more like the wilting uh, uh, of the foliage uh, at this time of the year. Uh, probably that will be uh, the most common thing. Sometimes on the on the saplings and uh, all the regeneration, you may have the leaves um, going black, but sometimes it's due to frost damage. And uh, you, you have to be aware of that as well. Sometimes it can be confused because of the wilting, uh, but it could be frost damage. Thank you, Anna. That's really helpful, actually. Um, do you want to move on to the next question, Anna? Where are we up to? Um, OK. Uh, if saplings uh, all around a mature ash have calara, is it inevitable that the mature trees also have it? I think this is one of the questions. I mean, normal, I think we have been kind of uh, replying to this already because normally um, the, the, the issue with Calara, two things, is um, the ascospores producing the fruit bodies can travel very long distances. Uh, but normally, if you have it in the older trees, one of the, uh, the ways to detect it is looking to the younger ones. And uh, obviously, the other way around is the Sapling, if you have a jam plantation, for example, and you get it, it's possible that the infection from the fallen grasses move to, other, to the older trees. Then I think it's, uh, it works both ways. Yeah. I don't, yeah. yeah, thank you, Anna. That's, that's very helpful. Does, um, are there any questions from the uh, uh, volunteers about uh, what Anna's been talking about before we move on to field-based detection? Okay, that sounds well. What, what, one of the other questions we've had is about, obviously, uh, what's our ability to um, uh, detect and identify ash dye back in the field. So if it's possible to move on two slides. Um, the, the majority of the uh, way that we identify organisms is either by the presence of their characteristic symptoms uh, or actually we then look at the organism under a microscope and they have certain visual or morphological features uh, which allow to identify many pests and diseases that we deal with in tree health. But in addition to that, also uh, organisms have uh, unique uh, chemical or molecular structures and we can use those chemical or molecular signatures to actually be able to identify them. So uh, something like Phytophthora, for example, we're able to use the unique chemical structure of its carbohydrates and proteins uh, to use uh, an antibody-based kit or the lateral flow device, which is sort of similar to a home pregnancy testing kit. And that allows us to detect uh, things like Phytophthora in the field. They're very simple and very easy to use, but it requires a lot of preparation work to actually get those uh, kits to work. So increasingly, we're moving to identifying the unique molecular or DNA structure uh, of the organisms we're dealing with. And specifically for ash dieback, uh, we've identified a unique piece of DNA of Calara that we can use to identify it. And that's how we routinely identify Calara in the laboratory, is using a molecular test. Uh, and we're able to take that technology out into the field uh, using a particular testing platform uh, called the uh, Genie. Um, and that's been used quite successfully on a number of outbreak sites. We've done quite a lot of validation work um, where we've taken a sample and tested it time and time and time and time again just to make sure that actually the equipment is reliable. Uh, and we found that we can take the same sample and test it on six different occasions, and it always gives us the same result. So we know it is nice and robust in that respect. What we also have done is compare the performance of the field-based equipment with the standard laboratory method. And again, we've got very high levels of agreement, about 96% 
agreement between testing in the field with testing in the laboratory. So that's how we that's how we're using uh, field-based uh, molecular and DNA-based techniques. If that's okay, I hope that helps. Do we have any other general questions on ash dieback uh, before we close? Just <laughs> Pam again up in Cheshire. Um, a question about the Octogene platform. Yeah. So is that something that tree health surveyors will be? Using, I know we were, we were talking about the Phytophthora test kit at yeah. the March training sessions. I mean, is it something that's going to be coming out to us, or is it tending to be something that stays with Forest Research, Ferrer, etc.? Is um, Helen Jones on the line? Perhaps you might be able to respond on that. Helen, are you there? No, I thought mm -hmm. Helen might be there. The, the, in the initial pilot project before we um, started the main observatory Hello. project. Hi, Helen. I was just on mute. Sorry. Would um, you like, did train would, some would, volunteers. Can you respond, Helen? Sorry. I can, yeah. Um, we did train some volunteers to use the genome machine um, during the pilot study of the uh, project, um, so back in 2013. Um, but at the moment, it was just felt that it was a, a one step too far for volunteers to be testing samples as well, um, because the machines are quite large and they also need quite a lot of storage, um, so the reagents and things need to be stored in a fridge. It was felt that at the moment this isn't something that we're going to be asking volunteers to do. Um, that's not to say that it won't happen in the future, um, but at the moment I, d I don't think there's any plans to, to have volunteers using the Genie machines. Okay, thank you. Great, Thanks, Helen, Alan. thank you. Okay, uh, any more questions on Ash Dieback? Um, yes, yeah, Adam again from Willingham City. Um, it's, some of these questions came from me because we just recently <laughs> found Kalara in the woods here, um, yeah. and which was expected. Um, but now, in now this sort of ten kilometer square has been marked off as having Kalara. Um, of course, I'm now seeing it everywhere. <laughs> but um, should we still be taking individual samples? to get tested even though this area has been sort of marked off as being a Kalara zone? Thank you, Adam. That's a really good question. I'll, I'll pass that to Anna, if that's all right, please. Yes. Um, what we are doing at the moment is if, you are, if you, your area is in a, in a square where we already have Kalara, basically we don't request more samples. However, if you are on the limit of that square, <laughs> Uh, to another square that is free of Calara, uh, we, we, we would like to have it checked. Then we take it, uh, depending on the, the area where it is on the square, we may request samples. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But basically, if you are in, a, in an square where you are surrounded by squares where Calara is present, we don't test uh, more samples. We don't. And is Although it, would, if you send samples to us, we'll check it for you, obviously. Um, and would you, I take it then you'd like us, if we, we're near squares which haven't been uh, yes. marked, then you would like us to go to those squares and check those that's areas? That's right. Yes, that's right. Yes. And if you find any samples that they are very close to the kind of the limit of the square, you know, uh, that will be, uh, we would like to see those as well. Um, um, I mean, just to follow up on that, of course, having found it here, and it being now known by the council and tree wardens and wood wardens, I'm getting lots of requests to look at ash trees. <laughs> yeah, and, I can imagine. Um, and it's, I mean, and the, from my knowledge, I, I'm looking at it and thinking, yep, yeah, it looks like it probably has. But knowing that, you know, I don't want to, you know, start taking in, you know, 10, 20 samples a week to send, send up if, if there's not a, a need to. Yeah. I know what you mean. I mean, as I said, you, if you are in a blue, I mean, one of the squares with um, Calara, uh, and you see the symptoms are consistent, I mean, I, it's no need to send them. However, if you have any samples that you are not sure, because maybe you think the symptoms are a bit different, you can yeah. always send it to us to have it checked here. Because there are other fungi that can cause, not the same, but similar kind of lesions on the, on the stem. 
and uh, you know if you are not sure or you think it actually doesn't look like it, uh, you can always send it here, and we can try to find out what it is for you. Okay, great. Thank you. That's great. Okay, we're we're just about a little bit over time, about a minute over time. So I just we I think we're going to sign off here. Uh, firstly, if there's any more questions or any more thoughts that come up from this, please just pop them on the forum, uh, and we'll get back to you uh, with answers in due course. Uh, and finally, just from all of us here, I just say thank you very much to all the volunteers uh, for getting involved, and it's been a really interesting webinar. Uh, we've got future webinars planned. They'll be coming up at the end of July, August, and September. Uh, and we'd be really grateful for feedback on today's webinar uh, in due course, just so we can make sure it works really well again. So thanks very much for your time, and we'll all sign off. <laughs>